Hello and welcome to The Reasons I'm Broke. I'm Daniel. And I'm Kelly. And this is episode number 23. In case you're new to this, this is the podcast in which Kelly and I talk about what made us broke every week. That includes comic books, uh, TV, movies, video games, toys, statues, all kinds of cool stuff. The best things that take our money away. (laughs) Things we shouldn't waste our money on. But But we we do. do. (laughs) (laughs) And we're going to start off by reviewing, jumping straight into DC. We all know what the big book is this week. No question what our pick of the week is going to (laughs) be. But first, we're going to start off with Batgirl number 17. This one was not written by Gail Simone. That's right. This is part, this is like a part of the two issue guest series written by Ray Fox and drawn by Daniel Sampier. I hope they get, I'm glad they're getting Gail Simone back. Yeah. (laughs) This, I, I, I won't say that it was a bad issue. It's following, um, James Gordon Jr. and how he's trying to bring down Batgirl through little things. So you have all these text boxes from him talking about she's doing this now and she's doing that and this will be her undoing and da da da. It's, I don't know. It, It felt really weird. It was also very different because there's this narrative thrown in here that's very wordy. And as Gail Simone has proven, you do not need that when writing Batgirl. It writes better when she's thinking to herself... Not right. when you have like this third person kind of talking about Batgirl and following her along. Right. I agree completely. It's, I don't know if it's going to lead into where Gail's going to pick up from, but I could, I could say you could skip this one. Yeah, skip out until number 19 when Gail Simone does get back on the series. Mm-hmm. And right away, Batman number <laughs> 17. This is the final issue in the Death of the Family series. Written by Scott Snyder, drawn by Greg Capolo, and inked by Jonathan Glapion. Pick of the week, no doubt for me. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. It was a great issue. It was an emotional roller coaster. We actually read it online first, bought it twice, because we didn't want to drive to the comic book shop. And emotional roller coaster, I was in tears. I was terrified. It was a fantastic issue. We're going to have to do an entire podcast just talking about this Death of the Family series and all its tie-ins. But we don't want to spoil too much with this one. Yeah, I definitely don't want to spoil number 17. I think we'll talk about it once the trade comes out, the full Death of the Family trade. That way we can both read it from beginning to end and actually have a more complete view of the entire story, not just the month-by-month books. But we actually read this online, like you said, because we couldn't wait till we could actually pick up the comics. It actually worked really well. I'm not a fan of digital comic books or reading them online on a computer or on a tablet. I like having the book in front of me, feeling the pages and churning them, and actually having the book tell me the story, not a computer screen. But it actually worked really well. When you go panel by panel, it's it keeps certain things from getting spoiled ahead of time. Some people like to view the entire page before they actually read the first panel. Sometimes you can't even help it when you turn the page, the splash page is right there in front of you and you already saw what happened. Sometimes they'll hide it by having it on the next page. But there's a certain reveal in this that would have been spoiled otherwise because the panel right underneath where it's building up this tension to this reveal is right there for you to see. Whereas when we're reading online, we're clicking panel by panel and just going, you know, one by one. It it was terrifying, guys, really. Very good issue. Very symbolic as well on Greg Capullo's part. Mm -hmm. There were some things that I didn't pick up, but when I was talking to other people about it, they, they point out how certain caves were drawn by Greg, how it symbolized the mask that Batman had because it does get broken up at one point and it's just very well written very well drawn Batman was in character with the way he reacted with the rest of the Bat family the way he reacted with Alfred it was all a very very tidy ending mm-hmm. yep fantastic issue like like you said when the trade comes out we'll probably do an entire podcast on it if you're watching on YouTube you'll get pictures as well we'll talk about the symbolism our feelings during it But we definitely don't want to give anything away because this was a phenomenal issue. Right. The only last thing I do want to touch on is a lot of people, the initial reaction they got from this is that wasn't, a lot of people think that it was very lackluster in its ending, that it kind of dropped it. Some people have even said that Scott Snyder has that problem where near the end, it's a little bit weaker than the rest of the story. I think it's just the way this was marketed in which people thought, including myself, that there was... There was going to be a radical change for the Bat family, which there is, but in a different way, in a more right. personal way for the family. It is all about a relationship, and I felt that 
the entire book, even though it was leading up to something big. I don't feel like I didn't feel cheated out near by the ending. I didn't. I think those people who feel let down are the ones who are always looking for action and big and you know over the top. And this isn't going to give you that ending. I think that this, in the long run, is worse than that over the top ending because what happens at the end of this when you really start because when I first read it, I too was like, oh well, that's that's all that happened. But then the more I sat down and thought about it, I was like, oh, shit, what's going to happen now that, you know, this, I can't give it away. <laughs> like, it's so hard to talk about it without giving it away. But that this this incident happened, how how's anybody going to recover from that? Right. And then there's still so much mystery left within it. It's, you know, what really happened and oh, it's it's madness. Very good book. If you're not reading it, shame on you. <laughs> Uh, we did pick up Batman Incorporated, number seven. This is, of course, written by Grant Morrison, drawn by Chris Burnham. Oh, now, the reason Morrison. we're... <laughs> yeah, we've picked up a couple of the Batman Incorporated books before the relaunch. We were not a fan of it. Oh. We, we don't like the idea of Batman going around the world. He wouldn't do it. Exactly. He wouldn't go around the world creating more of himself. Of himself. Exactly. Not only does he not want anyone to feel that pain... But he's too arrogant. <laughs> he wouldn't think anybody could. I mean, in his older years, he's come to trust the rest of the Bat family. But he doesn't think anyone can do what he does. And we know no one can Nobody do what he does. Nobody can do what he does. No, absolutely not. But we did start picking this up because, heads up, everyone, Batman Incorporated number 8 is going to have what I thought was the spoiler for Death of the Family. There's going to be a big change for Damian Wayne. What that is, we don't know yet. Is he gonna spoilers? I guess potentially, <laughs> if, if it does come true, it, will it be the death of Damian Wayne? No. Will it be Damian Wayne leaving the Robin costume behind? Maybe going back with Talia. I'm sure it has to no. do with the cloning. But issue number seven, it is the origin. I would say of Damian's clone, the grown-up version of himself. Right. Batman is in a safe underwater. Talia knows he's gonna get out, but she's calculated the exact timing for Batman. She has observed what it takes, how how many breaths he takes to, to actually run out of air and how long it would actually take him, how he moves and all that. Like she's she's his greatest enemy at this point. And now Damian Wayne is saying, Look, Alfred, I need to go out, I need to save my father and I need to confront mother. Which I love. I love that Damian always says father, mother. <laughs> mother. That's so yeah. formal and perfect that that's how Damian Now the only thing is the way Grant Morrison writes Damian, he's still a brat in his eyes. Yeah. Whereas someone else, like in the Batman and Robin books, Robin is Batman's son, and he's a good son. He's becoming a better person. Right. Here, he's still calling Alfred Pennyworth and ordering him around, which I don't like. Yeah, I agree. It's, I, I do not like Grant Morrison. I will just say that now. Um, and maybe it's because I haven't read the others. This one was really difficult for me to follow. I did like the father-son aspect of it where Bruce says, you know, Robin needs to stay here. And Robin was, no, I have to go. I have to, you know, he's my father. I have to save him. He remembers mother who she was, not who she is now. And she's ruthless now. I have to go. And I love the interaction with Alfred at the end where he just finally hands him his suit. And he says, I'll just say you overpowered me. Yeah, Alfred is awesome. <laughs> Alfred is amazing. And at the same time, Damien proved that he could have left the entire time. But he did want Alfred's approval. He wanted Alfred's permission. Right. Which speaks a lot about the character. Mm -hmm. And like you mentioned, he recognizes that Bruce Batman is seeing Talia as she was, not as she is. And that is, I think, a mistake on Batman's part. That's, um, I don't know what to call that. Is Batman being gullible? Is he, is he letting emotions get to him? What's going on? It just means he's better with Catwoman. <laughs> <laughs> That's what that boils down to. But make sure to get number seven, Batman Incorporated, if anything, so you know what happens in Batman Incorporated number eight, which I'm sure will lead to a big change in the relationship between Batman and Robin. If there's going to be a new Robin coming up, I still think Harper Row. We'll see what happens. Let's see. Next we have Batman and Robin number 17. This takes place directly after the events of Death of the Family, correct? Yes. I really liked this issue. Very good issue. It was a great issue. Alfred was my favorite part. He cracked me up. It's pretty much you go into the dreams of Robin, Batman, and Alfred following these events and seeing how messed up I guess they are. It's all very symbolic mm -hmm. of the characters. 
and how they each feel towards one another. Uh, I think Damien's especially is something we should keep note of because it shows a duality be in, within himself. Right. There is a cruel side to Damien that we have seen in the early issues of Batman and Robin and even before the New 52 relaunch. But at the same time, there's that other part of him that wants to be with Batman and wants to be Robin and just wants to make his father proud. Mm -hmm. There is a part in which he's holding his father's severed head and then there's him arguing with himself over why he keeps it or why he shouldn't be keeping it and how he does fear for Alfred's death and Batman's death. Right. But there's still that inner conflict, and that, I think, is going to be exactly what Batman Incorporated is going to be about. Right. I agree. I Especially Batman Incorporated introduces, or we get to see Damien's clone, like you said. And so you've got the duality within that as well to see where that's going to lead. Um, Alfred's Dream is my favorite, though. Oh, yeah. Oh, cracked me up. Alfred's standing there and Joker's uh, standing over all the Bat family with a hammer, just destroying them. Beating up their corpses. Yeah, yep, they're Joker-gassed corpses. And Alfred pulls out a shotgun and shoots his head off. It was the best. <laughs> and then you see Alfred, like, wake up real startled. And then he closes his eyes and smiles and goes back to sleep. Because in it, Joker is like, go ahead, shoot me, wipe this grin off my face. And Alfred says, gladly. Blows him away. Like, that's the cool thing about Alfred. He would not hesitate nope. to blow the fucking Joker away. Nope. And he would sleep well as he does. <laughs> when he wakes up in shock, falls back to sleep, a giant smile on his face. Oh, it was hilarious. Very um, good issue. And then at the end, you do have Batman's dream. Mm -hmm. And then you get to see, again, how much he loves Alfred. Or Damien. Alfred, Damien. How important he is to him. How he's finally fully stepped into that role as father. Where he can, I would say, more emotionally attach himself to Damien than I've seen in any other issue. And we'll speak more about that emotional connection between Batman and Damien when that Death of the Family trade comes out. Because mm -hmm. that last issue as well, Batman... Um, don't spoil, don't spoil! <laughs> la, 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 la. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very, cool. very good. I cried. I, I teared up. It's very nice. It was beautiful. And the last book on the DC side... This is Before Watchmen, Comedian, eh. number five of six. Eh. This is my pass. It's written by Brian Azzarello, written by J.G. Jones. Or, I'm sorry, drawn by J.G. Jones. That's uh, my pass. Yeah, it's my pass of the week as well. It yeah. is the weakest book of the Before Watchmen series. I think that now confirms it. Now, it's the weakest for us. If you're very political, I guess you could really like it. Yeah, I've heard a lot of people really like this book. They like it over Minutemen. Or even Silk Spectre, which were our two favorites. Right. I feel I feel that those two told a better story. This one, and I'm not huge into politics, but I I would go so far to say that it does shine a lot of light on how politics is and how it runs as far as wars and, and how it looks at other nations within wars. Yeah, the respect that our soldiers or the people that we even send out to try to control certain situations, how they may really view the people of those countries, or right. how war is actually... It, it's, we're not the good guys all the time, is I guess what this book is kind of saying, and it's, it's more corrupted by the fact that Comedian is running around in these nations doing whatever the hell he wants. Right, Comedian just walks... You know, the whole... This whole issue is him talking with another soldier, and the soldier's talking about, you know, how, how can you just go into these cities... And destroy these people. You know, they're old people, women, children. They're not even fighting back. And the comedian's whole thing is they're all the enemy. That's, that's pretty much how we view it. It's all a big joke. It's all the enemy. And then at the end, you know, you, you actually see this other soldier get shot by U.S. forces. And then you read a letter written by somebody saying this guy died with the highest honors in battle. When we were actually the ones who shot him. Right, it goes back to that irony that comedian is always about that it's all a joke it's all a joke yeah it's i don't enjoy it again if you're big into politics i guess other people might enjoy it or if you're big on like i guess analyzing who the character is of comedian yeah. there's a lot of that in here so if you really like the comedian I'd, i guess i'd say pick up these series but we're going to finish off number six when that comes out just because we've made it this far uh, i think we're looking forward to the most what is it dr manhattan and ozzy mm -hmm. see yeah. how those finish off and Rorschach, too. And there were those two other ones that came out from before Watchmen. We didn't pick up them up. Yeah. There was Dollar Bill. I think it was Moloch. Something like that. He was some, like, spooky magician man. 
<laughs> yeah, I heard those weren't very good. <laughs> Can I name it Spooky Magician Man before Watchmen? <laughs> Spooky Magician Man. <laughs> yeah, this is the best book ever. I need to write that. And on the indie side, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles number 18. This one's written by Kevin Eastman and Tom Waltz. And the art is by Ben Bates. That's the new artist that took over, I think, about two or three issues ago. I like the art. I'm enjoying the art. It's mm-hmm. very good. I think it's, it's, it is a change, but it's a good change. It's still very good. Right. Um, this one is picking up where the last one left off, where they're on another planet with pretty much Zelda people. Mm-hmm. They, they look like Zelda people. Actually, the princess looks like Zelda. Um, and they're being taken over by the Krang. Yeah, Krang's army. Mm-hmm. And it's... The turtles get teleported there because they were bringing back a robot professor that April was friends with. And it makes more sense when you read it than when I try to explain it. The last issue, I was totally lost. This one makes more sense. I still, I think it's too sci-fi for me. Yeah, I do like it better when it's more about the relationship between the turtles. Right. And uh, even I'll even take in like the spiritual ninja aspect of it that we're seeing from the Foot Clan miniseries. That's a great miniseries. Where it's all about uh, reincarnation and how mm-hmm. the turtles, what their lives used to be. But you're right, this is a little too sci-fi. And I think once we get over the Krang, we're going to go back to back to the mutants, back to this, the uh, mutagen, the ooze, all that stuff. Well, I even I even love where you get to see not only the turtles interacting within themselves but how they're dealing with the outside world. And that's what I like to see from the Turtles. That's what I like to see from most of my comics, is, you know, you're not going into a sci-fi or a magical or anything like that side of it, but something that could live in this world so that you could think, hey, maybe if I go to this town, I'll run into them too. And that's not what you're going to get from this comic. It, It was still good, but it's a little too out there for me. For you, your favorite is Michelangelo. He had yes, some good moments in this. He did. Michelangelo is <laughs> the best. I think that's what's holding a couple of these issues up is that characterization between all the turtles and, like you said, right. the air interaction between them. Uh, it's still a good read. I, I actually enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. The art, like we said, is really great, too. Um, and if you're up on YouTube, I'm sure that you have pictures of it as well. Yep. And now, okay, so if it wasn't for Batman, this one would be my pick of the week. Over Batman and Robin, even? Batman and Robin was good, too. If it wasn't for Batman... <laughs> in general. <laughs> Batman in general, except for Batman Inc. It beats out Batman. beats out Batgirl, too. So if it wasn't for those two Batman, this would be my pick of the week. Bravest Warriors number 5. Again, it's created by Pendleton Ward. Hilarious. Written by Joey, Joey Cameo. Mm-hmm. And illustrated by Mike Holmes. A lot of innuendo in this one. Yeah, there is. <laughs> you enjoyed that. Takes place in a beauty pageant where I guess all the pageant girls' brains are being stolen. So Beth shows up with a bazooka, sticks it in some guy's mouth, demands to know where all these girls' brains are. That's kind of where it ends. But you get this whole story leading up to it where all the guys get shirtless. I don't know. (laughs) To appear tougher. (laughs) (laughs) To appear tougher. Because they get a knock on the door in the middle of the night. Danny wakes up. He's like, oh, I better take my shirt off so I seem tougher. He's fully (laughs) dressed, but he wants to seem like he sleeps naked or something. And it's pretty much the CIA of the future. And he's like, oh shit, they're going to find out I hacked the moon. <laughs> How do you hack the moon? I don't know. Um, but it was a really cute issue. Yeah, I really like the... I think my favorite innuendo was when he wakes up from the nightmare and it's like, oh, it was the planet of bananas again. <laughs> <laughs> and that's where they end it. Like, it goes to the next panel. And <laughs> they like, never oh, bring it up again. <laughs> It's that kind of humor that you, you know, it could be silly to a kid, but to an adult, you're like, what were those bananas doing to you? <laughs> Going up your ass. <laughs> <laughs> Gross. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was a really good issue. I think it's cons- it has the notes at the bottom again, too. Yeah. Like you love, like all the Adventure Times do. Um, it's, I think it's staying strong. This is the beginning of a new arc. We'll see how far it gets. Yeah, I mean, I think that'll do it for comics this week. Mm-hmm. A couple of things that did get announced uh, since the last podcast. Place, the next PlayStation, whatever they decide to call it, PlayStation 4 or whatever, that will be announced. A lot of people are speculating in a couple of days. That's on uh, the 20th. Um, so far, um, there's been a couple of leaks. Uh, whether or not they're true, who knows. But this day and age, a lot of the sources do tend to be a little bit more reliable, mm-hmm. especially if they have a track record of that. One of the latest things they've said is that PlayStation 3 games will stream on this new system. Of course, that's because the hardware is completely different from what I understand. They completely changed companies. I believe it was NVIDIA that was doing the hardware for the last, uh, the PlayStation 3 and the Xbox. And they got greedy. 
Well, now they have this new technology that is simply incompatible with the PlayStation 3 games. So now they have a new, um, completely new machine, new stuff inside it. So instead, what they're going to do is they're going to offer a service. You pay a monthly fee or however they want to do it. I don't know if they're going to do it through PlayStation Plus. And then it'll just simply stream all the PS3 games that you, whatever the plan is. And that's what they're saying. What do you think is... Do you think that's a good plan? or? I think that's a wonderful plan. If, if, like, I know people are going to be mad, like, oh, I spent all this money on games, and now I can't play them. Keep your PS3, whatever. But I think that, I mean, it's like Netflix. You mm -hmm. know, charge them 20 bucks a month. Even charge them 30 bucks a month. Do you know how many games you can play in a month? They can probably get away with a lot more than, than that. They can probably charge 50 a month, I would say. Right, or even if, okay, it's part of PlayStation Plus. Raise the price of that. Charge them a hundred bucks a year for PlayStation Plus. That averages down to less than ten bucks a month, and you get to play as many games as you want. Yeah, I'm curious if more games are going to be moving in this direction. If other systems will be taking this technology and doing more with it. Wonder how that would work with DLC and whether or not that would just download straight into whatever game you're playing or streaming right. at the time. Either way, it's a pretty good idea, I guess. If if this machine really can't do the PlayStation 3 games, then this is a really good alternative. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, and then you have, you know, games that are maybe harder to find, and now you can play them. More games, you know, you log in. Oh, you know, I never wanted to buy this game, but look, it's up here today. Let me play it. Yeah, we'll know in a few days. Let's mm -hmm. see what they say. And finally, we'll end it with some Pokemon news. There was a new evolution, a new EV oh, evolution. Too many EVs. I'm pretty sure this is a Steel-type evolution, no. is what they revealed. That's what I thinking it looks like it looks nothing did you sit down and look at all the steel types because i did the other day and it looks nothing like any steel type <laughs> i still think it is with a it name what is it sylvie or sylvia <laughs> it could be a normal type or maybe they're introducing a new type and it's one of those new types maybe it's like a light type maybe it, yeah, looks, it could be true it looks too girly to be a steel type but it is an ev evolution and i know you were doubting me about it being an ev evolution I was right. <laughs> well, I know everything about love, as we learned from Paul Dini. No, I still don't think it's a steel type. So maybe we could be half and half right. Are we well, going to make a bet on this? It doesn't matter. You're not going to be getting the game anyway. No, so. are, are we going to make a bet on this? Because I like our bet. You think it's a normal type? I, I don't think it's a steel type. It's either a normal type or a brand new type that they're making up. Well, I'm not going to... I don't feel comfortable setting, settling on this bet here with these conditions. Well, okay, fine. I think it's a normal type. I think it's a steel type. Okay, then. We'll see who's right. Okay. Well, what if neither of us are right? Well, then we're both wrong. Dating <laughs> <laughs> the obvious. We still need to make a bet. I want to yeah. win something. But you'll hear more about that next week as well with the new Sony console, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Other than that, I think that'll do it this week. You can find us on Twitter at Reasons I'm Broke. Let us know what made you broke this week. Hashtag Reasons I'm Broke. If you're listening to us on iTunes, make sure to leave a review. That helps people find us. And if you're watching this on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe. Let us know how we're doing, how we can improve, what can change. And also, we did put up the Let's Play Dead Space 3 videos. We put yep. up two of them. Uh, they're in the annotations from the last week's podcast, and I'm going to go ahead and put them on this week's as well. We didn't get much feedback on that, so I'm not sure if we're going to just switch games, maybe do Arkham City or Lego Batman 2 next, or just the not Sims. do them at all. <laughs> I need to play... Now I'm going to work. I work at the hospital. I'm a surgeon... I got to eat. <laughs> oh, oh, he's hungry. Oh, he just wet himself. <laughs> It'd be the greatest game ever. But yeah, thanks for listening. Uh, we'll see you next week. I'm Daniel. And I'm Kelly.